We talked about foundation. We started talking about that last week. Our foundation is important for us when you're building a house. You need a good solid foundation, whether it's on a slab or whether there's a basement. And as uh, we mentioned last week, our basement wall had to be repaired and strengthened so that the house would stand. Uh, otherwise, eventually, if the, the storm came, a strong enough storm, that perhaps the foundation would give way and the house would collapse. And we see that in the news every now and then. So the house's foundation is, is vitally important. A foundation of any kind, if you're going to go into academics, you need a good, strong foundation before you can study algebra and calculus and trigonometry. You have to understand addition and subtraction and division and multiplication. And so you need a solid foundation. Before you can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, you have to be able to count your numbers. And you have to understand odd numbers and even numbers. And that's we start all that back, you know, in preschool now these days. So you have to have a good foundation so that you can build upon the foundation. In order to be able to read the great works of English literature, or more importantly, the great works of the Bible, all the books, you have to understand the alphabet. So you start with that little song with the children and sing the alphabet. And from that, you start to form words. And then you start stringing words together into sentences. And before long, children are reading at an appropriate grade level, hopefully. And at some point in time, then eventually you teach them to read the Bible. But we start out early with that as well. Just because they can't read you know, Hebrews and understand Romans doesn't mean they can't understand that God loved them. And for God so loved the world. So we are... Always building a foundation. It's the same thing spiritually. We have to build a spiritual foundation for ourselves so that we can then, from that strong foundation, launch into ministry and do whatever the Lord has called us to do in our own particular lives. And that's what's, that was the crux of what we were trying to build upon last week. Again, from Matthew chapter 7, uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, we'll read that once again. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine, Jesus said, and doeth them, we pointed out the importance of not just hearing, but actually doing the word of God. He says, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority. Not like the scribes, who were the religious leaders of the day. They taught, but not with someone who seemed to have authority over the word. As you know, Joe and I like to take our vacations uh, down the west coast of Florida, and down in the Fort Myers Beach area. And there's a lot of controversy going on down there in that city right now. Because the, actually it's the state of uh, Florida has uh, determined that in certain uh, flooding zones that all new construction must be built up on piers. And so, you know, your cute little cottage right there on the beach uh, is grandfathered in. It was built back in the 50s or 60s. But occasionally when they have hurricanes, those uh, poor little cottages and homes get flooded out. And people understand this and they try to give them as much warning. So they move their possessions either up to higher ground or into the attic or maybe take them uh, off the... Uh, off the island or so forth, but every once in a while, every whatever, 5, 10, 20 years, a big storm will come through and will flood everything out. So uh, the state of Florida has said all new construction, including houses, have to be built up at least a certain number of feet. I forget what the number is, 6 or 8 or whatever feet. And the idea is that uh, when the floods come, your house is still high and dry because the water just does nothing but maybe washes out the garage a little bit. And that's about it. The problem is, is when you raise those buildings, you block the view. That's where everybody's upset about it. So you have this new construction along the beach, and you have these houses. look like their houses on stilts, basically. And, uh, but, but people used to be able, maybe they were a half a block away from the beach, and they could still look out over and in between the houses or whatever and see the, the, the Gulf of Mexico. It's all being blocked now by these big houses that are up on stilts. So everybody's upset about that. Well, the reason they do that, of course, is so to avoid flood. And when you avoid the floods, you avoid the insurance claims that come when the floods inevitably do. And so the insurance industry is certainly happy about this sort of thing because they don't have to pay so many claims, although flooding insurance is still expensive in that area from what I understand. But floods do come, and the question is, what are you doing about the foundation? Now, those piers, those stilts, if you will, that those houses are built upon are dug deep down into that soil uh, because it wouldn't do any good if you built the houses up on the piers if the piers were unstable. The piers would collapse, the house would collapse, and you'd be back to where you were before. Again, the same thing spiritually occurs. We have to be careful about how we're building our spiritual house. And what kind of soil or what kind of rock are we digging into? Are we digging into the milk of the Word, which is for babies? 
or we dig into the meat of the word, which is for those who have matured past the point of infancy and spiritual infancy. So we must understand that the importance of establishing our lives on a sure foundation, if we're going to be useful and sturdy and permanent, we have to be on a solid base. So what did Jesus teach about our personal foundation? Well, he said, like a wise man built on a solid foundation, the important thing was, as we noticed, noted there, that he who hears his sayings is important, but you do that. Part of building a strong foundation is not just hearing the Word of God, but doing the Word of God. There's a difference. A lot of people will hear. Remember the big crusades that Billy Graham used to hold, uh, where tens of thousands of people would fill these big arenas and, and stadiums and so forth, and there were tens of thousands of people uh, who were hearing the Word of God, and then he would give the altar call, and you'd see all these people streaming down the aisles. But what most people didn't realize is that a lot of those people were volunteers that were actually going down to help counsel the ones who were really responding to the invitation. So while it looked pretty impressive to see hundreds of people going down, they weren't all just going down to receive Christ. Now, you know, we say often that if you do that, you have a big crusade, and even one soul gets saved, it was worth the crusade. And I would agree with that. Uh, but on the other hand, we have to understand that it's more than just going down to the altar, wherever it might be, and just saying a, a prayer with the, the pastor or the evangelist, and then walk away and say, well, I'm done. Now I can go on with the rest of my life. That is just the beginning. That is just the, the very tip of the, of the uh, process. We need to build upon that. That's why we have discipleship classes, and that's why we have to disciple the young believers. That's why Paul took young Timothy under his wing to disciple him as an example to us. So if you have a new person, a new Christian, then it's incumbent upon us to teach them about the Word of God, to encourage them to read the Bible, to, to maybe read the Bible with them, maybe meet with them periodically, uh, maybe meet them for coffee once a week and do a little one-on-one -on -one counseling or Bible study, whatever the Lord might lead you to do so. If there's somebody inside your own household, then you can do it on a, on a daily basis by example and teaching them how to pray, whether it's just saying grace or whether it's actually reading a Bible story each night before going to bed or in the morning when you first wake up. Maybe helping them with some Bible memory verses, a few things like that, to help them to continue to grow on that foundation. The foundation is accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, but that uh, is not where we want to stay. We want to grow from that so that they can, in turn, someday turn around and they'll witness and disciple the next generation that comes behind them. So the wise man not only heard the Word of God, but did the Word of God and does the Word of God. Whosoever cometh to me, the very first step, of course, as we said, is coming to the Lord hearing his sayings, and then doing them. So it's a three-part process right there. Can one hear and not do? Well, the answer is yes. In Luke 6.46 it says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You call me Lord, as so many people give the Lord lip service, and make a big thing of calling Jesus their Lord. They'll celebrate his birth, his death, his resurrection, sing songs, have even great crusades, but you do not do the things which I say. James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So if you know what you're supposed to be doing, the Holy Spirit has told you what you need to be doing, you know that burden in your heart, you have that person maybe in your life that you know you should be witnessing to, or you have that service that you're supposed to be performing in ministry, or to your church, or to uh, perhaps a Christian organization, maybe a life-affirming uh, organization that uh, helps uh, young pregnant uh, women, for example, to save their babies, and you're not doing that, and you know you should be doing that, it's sin if you don't do it. Pretty plain and simple. What is a man like who hears and does the word? He is like a man which builds a house on a rock. Digging deep. We dig deep into the word of God. And because it helps us in our own spiritual foundation, just because we get to a point perhaps where we maybe we're maturing, maybe we have gotten a lot of into the Word, it doesn't mean that we can rest on our laurels after a certain period of time. If you really want to mature, it's a lifelong process. Someone who's been a Christian for 10 years has not fully matured, nor has the person who's been a Christian for 60 years fully matured. As long as we are drawing breath in this life, we should continue the maturation process until we get to heaven. And then you know what happens when we get to heaven? We'll continue to mature. We'll continue to grow. Because there's so much that we don't even know here in this earth. Even Bible scholars will tell you, those, you know, the professors of the great theological schools who have spent their entire lifetime, so 60, 70 more years studying the Word of God, preaching the Word of God, teaching it to their classes and so forth, they'll be the first to tell you, almost to a man or woman, that the more they learn about the Bible, the less they realize they understand about the Bible. Because it's a continuous process. When we get to heaven, 
The study is not going to be done, but we'll be able to sit at the feet of the master, the teacher himself, and he'll be able to teach us directly out of his word. The word will never go away. The word is eternal, even in heaven. The necessity of building on the rock, the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently on that house. Life is full of problems. This is a, a situation that's talking about us. We are mature, but you know what? Just because we're mature Christians doesn't mean that our life is easy. Things happen to Christians as well, including martyrdom the most extreme form of punishment, torture, or maybe it's just the cares of this life. It's interesting, don't seem, the storm seem to come in batches, you know, so you have a tough time uh, financially, and then you find out that something else has happened, and you lose a job, when you lose a job, then somebody's health gets bad, you have doctor bills, and you have, uh, then the car breaks down, and you have mechanic bills, it all seems to come at you at one time. These are storms. These are storms of life. The question is, are you going to get swept away by the storm? Are you going to get overwhelmed? Or are you going to stand on your solid rock of foundation and say, even though the storms come, I still trust in Jesus Christ my Lord. He will see me through. He will meet every need of my life. <clears throat> even righteous Job, remember, lost his ox, his donkeys, the servants that kept him, his sheep and the servants that kept them, his camels and the servants that kept them, and finally his children, and apparently all that in less than an hour's worth of time. In Job uh, chapter 1. Only his unshakable faith in God kept him going. Even in spite of his friends and his wife who finally said, you know what, give up on God. Joe said, nope, I trust in God. He's given me all these blessings before. It's his right to take them away if he wants to. And he can bless me again if he wants to. And of course, we know the end of the story. And that's exactly, not only did God bless him and restore whatever was taken, he blessed him even more than what he had in the first place. Because Job remained faithful. And God uh, is going to be one who will bless you when you remain faithful to Him. Uh, the worst thing that can happen to you in this world is that you lose your life. But that's from the world standpoint. For us, we get graduated to heaven and we will have blessings beyond imagination, riches beyond imagination, the eternal presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and whatever that means, and our minds can't fathom that, beyond imagination, beyond, beyond human understanding. And we'll have that for all eternity. Whatever you have that you think is pretty nice right now, nothing compared to what you're going to have when you get to heaven. And you'll have all of your loved ones there with you as well. You'll have your parents, your grandparents, great-grandparents, anybody who's died in the Lord previously, your best friend, maybe you lost a best friend at a young age. Well, if that friend was a Christian, you'll be with that best friend for all eternity. Your children, if we, by God's grace, live to be a ripe old age and we just go on to glory, then the children that we brought up behind us, if they continue on in the Word of God, and someday in their ripe old age, they will go on to glory. You'll be reunited with your children again. All eternity. You'll have them for all of eternity. You'll never be separated ever again. Only in his unshakable faith in God kept Job going. And in his day, remember that he did not have the Holy Spirit yet given as a comforter. We have a holy comforter that helps us in, in today's time. Job didn't even have yet that uh, then, but yet he was so faithful. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. We are called. We are the called according to His purpose. So all things will work together for good. Faith. But you have to have faith to understand that. Even when life's storms come against you. So what happened to the house of the rock in Luke 6, 48? The storm couldn't shake it. Couldn't knock it down. The storms of life, if you're founded on the rock of Jesus Christ, a confession of faith, the Word of God, it can't knock you down. You may still have to deal with it, but it can't knock you down. You're unmovable. You're unshakable. You are the child of God. God will look out for His children, just as you look out for your own children. The house without the foundation, of course, fell in ruin. And the flood is not interested in excuses or reasons, by the way. When the flood come, came against the house, it didn't say, Oh, I'm sorry, you built your house on sand. Well, I'll go around your house and I'll hit the next house. The floods of life don't care whether or not you're built on a strong foundation. The floods don't care that you're built on the Word of God. They're still going to come at you. What is your reaction going to be? Are you going to stand strong or are you going to give way? We can't build our spiritual houses on hope sows or good enough. Salvation has to be the Word of God. Who has to build on that sure foundation that the apostles taught us. If you have your body, you're a hymnal. Everybody grab a hymnal right now. Turn to page 492 all the way in the back. 492. Talking about the foundation. The page number is at the bottom, all the way in the back. A little different from the. You'll see the Apostles' Creed there. 492. This is what we believe. This is our sure foundation. 
If you find that, I want you to stand with me, and we're going to read this together. Let's stand, and we're going to read the apostles. We're going to stand on this creed. This is what we believe. This is our foundation. This is the Apostles' Creed, the foundation of our church. Let's read together in unison. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Somebody asks you, what do you believe? You can point to that right there. So that's what we believe. That's our foundation. That sums it up very nicely, the Christian tenets. The apostles taught these things about our personal foundation. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of dead, and of eternal judgment. So once we have the Apostles' Creed and the belief in what those tenets were, once we understand that we are born again, we are children of God, joint heirs with Christ, we have to grow from there. And that's what Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine, the basics of the doctrine, we have to move on from there. Let us go on unto perfection. We call that the sanctification process, a fancy word that we use in denominational the teachings, the sanctification process or the perfecting process. What does that mean? Well, it means doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. Those are just as a partial list of some of the things that we then start to learn and build upon because we have the basic foundation of believing in Jesus Christ. This isn't to say that we don't need the foundation, but once it is laid, we go and build on that foundation. If you're building a house on a rock and you pour the foundation on that rock, you've got a solid foundation, well, that's wonderful, but it doesn't do you any good. You can't live on a foundation. You have to actually build a structure on top of that. And that's the same thing in the spiritual life. We have a foundation when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and proclaim Him uh, to be King of kings and Lord of lords. That's our foundation. That saves our souls so that we go to heaven, but that doesn't just, it just lays there. It doesn't do any benefit us or the world. We have to build a structure, a spiritual structure on top of that so that we become productive. We go on to build that foundation, as can be seen from the context of these verses. In fact, the entire fifth chapter explains the necessity of our growing into maturity. The foundation described consists of six things there. Repentance from dead works. Notice the dead works. Faith toward God. Number three, doctrine of baptisms. Four, laying on of hands. Five, resurrection of the dead. And six, eternal judgment. And it's impossible for us to go on unto perfection unless we lay that foundation correctly at the beginning. It builds on that. That's why so many churchgoers don't grow and mature into soldiers of the cross because the foundation was never properly laid down. After the foundation is laid down, then we can go on. And that's what we must do. It's important for us to lay that strong foundation. What kind of foundation have you laid in your own life? What kinds of things are you doing to ensure that foundation? You know, eventually... There was a special, I forget which channel it was, Discovery Channel, History Channel, one of those channels. And there was a series about what would happen if a city was abandoned. I forget the name of the series, maybe some of you saw that. And so they would take a, a city, they would model, say, New York City. And say, what if for some reason the city had to be abandoned? There was a plague, there was this or that or the other. How long would it take for nature to reclaim that city, basically? And so they used computer modeling. Uh, so forth, and you can actually see events. You know, look at your own house. If you have a, a crack in the sidewalk, a little weed will pop up through there. If you don't cut that weed off, then a second weed will grow, and a third, and then you have a, a group of weeds or some grass, and eventually they will force, you think that a, a weed is not that strong compared to concrete or some grass, but you get enough in there, it'll start to split the sidewalk open. It'll start to crack the concrete. That's how strong that force of nature is. 
So that's why I have to keep weeding all the time, we, especially even in the cracks. We go out here in, in the summer in our parking lot, and we'll see there are cracks there. We have to seal the parking lot every other year or so in order to keep the weeds out of that. And every once in a while, especially along the edges, I have to go there and I have to spray some uh, weed and grass killer on there to keep it from reclaiming the parking lot. If we stopped using our church parking lot in just a couple of years, it would be overgrown with weeds and grass, and enough years would go by, you would never know there was a parking lot underneath there because it had been taken over. Same thing in these, these illustrations, these demonstrations that we saw on TV. And it was in a very relatively short period of time, within 50 or 100 years, uh, a lot of the building uh, uh, walls would be cracked because vines would be growing up and the wild animals would be coming in and they'd be doing whatever they, they do, uh, foraging for food and so forth. And just in a couple hundred years, uh, the, the city would be uninhabitable completely, forever, unless somebody actually went in, wiped everything out and built a brand new city on top of it. It wouldn't take long. But you have to build a firm foundation. But not only build the firm foundation, you have to tend to it. It's like a garden. You plant a garden. There are a lot of you probably planting gardens right now. You have to tend it to the garden. You have to weed the garden. If you just plant the seeds there and walk away and hope to come back in a couple months and pick your strawberries or your beans or whatever it is, most likely there won't be much there to pick because the weeds will have grown up and will have choked out the, the plants or the wild rabbits would have come and eaten your strawberries, or the aphids would have come and destroyed the plants. You have to tend the garden. So you can't just plant a nice garden, you have to look after it. Same thing spiritually, you can't just plant a foundation, you have to look after it, you have to tend to your foundation. You have to grow upon your foundation. You have to continue to weed out the sin that tries to creep in on your spiritual foundation. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean Satan leaves you alone. Doesn't mean that he stops tempting you. You have to continue to monitor and you have to continue to stay close to the Lord and to the Word of God. The Bible says, hide God's Word in your heart so that you might not sin against Him. <clears throat> well, that's part of tending to the foundation is Bible memorization. Because what happens when you're tempted, if you've been reading, uh, memorizing your Bible, very often you'll find that when that temptation comes, a Bible verse will come to you right away as well. And you can quote that Bible verse. You can stand on that Word of God and that temptation will flee away from you. Satan can't stand to be in the presence of God and His Word. He hates it when you quote the Word of God to him. So, if you want to be fully armed when the enemy comes after you with a temptation, quote the Word of God to you. Not everybody can carry a Bible around with them all the time. Oh, there's a temptation. Let me, let me, I know there's a verse about that temptation. Let me go to my concordance. Uh, okay, sin temptation. Oh, look at this. this I'm going to read this verse. Well, by that time, you may have already given to the temptation. But most of us don't have the luxury of carrying a Bible around 24-7, although, I say that, but one good thing about technology is you can carry your Bible around actually with you all the time now. So, uh, but what if you're driving? Let's uh, use that as an example. Somebody cut you off. What's temptation? <laughs> there, but for the grace of God go I, or, you know, Lord bless uh, the sinner that just cut me off, or are you going to say something less positive about that. So you can't stop, pull over, you know, dial up the Bible up here, look for the temptation to say something, uh, you know, mean about somebody. So if you have that ready to go, that's why God says memorize it. So no matter where you are, if you maybe some place where you don't have a cell phone, you know, there's certain places now where they actually jam your cell phone signal, because like a movie theater, for example, where they don't want you texting or doing things while you're, you know, supposed to be doing whatever, paying attention to something else. Maybe in some in some schools. Students, uh, are the, the cell phones have been rendered useless while you're in class because the teachers don't want the kids to be you know, playing games or texting each other or cheating on their tests, so the cell phones are no good. Or they may even collect your cell phone and put them in a box. After the test, you can come pick up your cell phone. Well, what if you're tempted to cheat in the middle of a test? You know, that word of God come right to you. It says, oh, don't do that. Don't steal, don't cheat, don't lie. Maybe the Ten Commandments will come to you. Don't bear a false witness. It's okay. The temptation was there. The temptation is not the sin. It's giving into the temptation. I'll keep my eyes on my own paper and I'll just do my best. As the Lord, you can pray the Lord helps you remember what you studied. Hopefully you were a good student and studied ahead of time. He's not just going to usually give you the answers if you haven't put any effort in to begin with, but that's another sermon altogether. So, building the proper foundation, getting into the Word of God. Getting into Bible study. That's one good thing again about attending a Bible study, whether it's here at the church or you have a neighborhood Bible study or maybe you've got a, a group of friends at uh, work that you can study the Bible with at a lunchtime or after or before work. It's because it helps you and helps them understand and uh, build upon each other's experience and you can encourage each other. Uh, I worked for a uh, company in, out in Tulsa and uh, a group of us, uh, one, of, one of the ladies actually decided, uh, she knew that there were several of us that were Christians 
serious about her faith. She said, why don't we get together Monday mornings before work and have a time of prayer? And uh, with permission from the, the owner that we could just go into one of the offices. Uh, before work started, we were going to steal any time from the company itself. As I think the work day started at 8, we were getting there at 7.15 on Monday or something. And we just uh, spent some time in prayer. So the group of us did that. That was wonderful. A uh, great way to start the week, by the way. So it can be done in the workplace. So there are others that have little uh, Bible studies, maybe once a week, Wednesday afternoon at lunch. Maybe it's a little gathering in your your uh, your company or your, your place of, of work, and you have some fellow Christians, and you can just encourage each other once a week. But it's important to do that, iron sharpening iron. Uh, maybe you've got family members. Maybe you've got a family situation where you can gather the family together uh, and uh, maybe read some of the Word of God and pray together and encourage each other. But it's building that foundation. It's not just being static. Because you're either going to advance or you're going to retreat in the kingdom of God. There's no just staying put. If you say, well, I'm a Christian now and you know, I know a little bit about the Bible, I, I go to church occasionally and I'm good to go, I'm ready for eternity, I'll just live my life and I'm not going to commit any major crimes or anything. Don't worry about me, I believe in God. Well, you're not static. You're not lukewarm. You're either hot or you're cold. The Bible says it'll spit you out of your mouth if you try to be lukewarm. So you're going to be one or the other. There's no standing on the fence or sitting on the fence. If you're not advancing in the kingdom of God, you are retreating from the kingdom of God. That's why you have to continue to stay in the word of God. Building on that firm foundation. Who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever? Remember the psalmist said that it is God Almighty who laid the foundations, the spiritual foundations. As the whirlwind passeth, so is the wicked no more, but the righteous is an everlasting foundation. We should be the rock. We should be the beacon that people look towards. When things go on in life and things go haywire, things go sideways, maybe you're working at a company and everybody gets laid off. The company's going out of business. Everybody's concerned, as they should be, about, well, how do I take care of my family? How do I you know, pay my bills and so forth? And you'll have the same concerns, but the difference between you and someone who's not a believer should be in how you handle the news. And so you handle the news by saying, I still trust in God. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills, but God knows. And he knows they have obligations, and he's going to make a way. While the other people are pulling their hair out, and they're screaming, and wondering how we're going to do this, and they're cursing, and, and struggling, and, and uh, you know, basically losing it. But you stay calm because you know that it's not about you. It's not, it's not up to you. You leave it up to God to take care of you in the midst of the storms. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried or tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. The cornerstone is important. When you're starting out a new building, you've got to lay the cornerstone exactly right because the walls will go out from there. If the cornerstone is off here by just an eighth of an inch, by the time you get down to the end of the wall, you can go up by a couple of feet. So you have to have the cornerstone exactly true and perfect. Then you can build the walls out and up, and you have a sure foundation. Jesus is our cornerstone. So when we build our foundation on that rock, that rock doesn't roll. That is the rock that stays true. And then our lives and our spiritual lives will be true as well. And then as we build upon that foundation, our spiritual lives and our spiritual building will be true and strong forever and ever. So let's examine our lives each and every day. Lord, what can I do? As David said, Lord, examine my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. Because I want to lead a life of, of uh, love and, and passion and truth and understanding for Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. So search my heart, O God. We sing a song about that. Search my heart and reveal any wicked way in me so that if there is sin in my life, maybe I'm not even aware that I've, I've sinned. Maybe I have offended somebody and I was just oblivious to the situation, but I hurt their feelings. And see if there's anything, maybe there's something new that I'm doing. I didn't realize that the Bible spoke out against it. Maybe I just don't remember reading that part. You say, well, I'm innocent. Well, but it's still sin and you still need to repent of it when the Holy Spirit reveals that to you. If you're not doing something that you're supposed to be doing as we read earlier, then it's a sin. And you need to repent. Not only repent, but then go start doing whatever it is that God has told you to do. Make amends as necessary. So examine your lives today. Examine your lives this week. And pray that prayer. Lord, it can be embarrassing. But Lord, if there's any wicked way in me, reveal it to me so that I can confess it and I can repent of it. And then I can move on from there and do whatever it is that you've called me to do with that sin out of my life. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your blessing. And 
Lord, we are not immune to temptations. In fact, you said, said the temptation will come our way, but we are to flee from the temptation. We can do so by speaking the word of God. It is quick and powerful. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. It is sharper than any temptation that comes our way. When we stand on the sure foundation of Jesus Christ, the rock, our cornerstone, and we build our walls through the sanctification process, become a strong and mighty tower. You are the strong and mighty tower that we run into, but we can also build a strong, firm wall of defense. So when the enemy's arrows are slung against us, so we can quench those fiery darts with our shield of faith. We can put on the whole armor of God, the belt of truth, and we can yield the, the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation, and belt a, a sheet, a feet shod with preparation, the gospel of peace. Lord, may this be a, a sure foundation for us each and every day. Maybe there is somebody here this morning, however, who does not have that sure foundation. Maybe you have tried to build your house on the sand of life. And the storms have come and it's starting to knock you over. And you're not sure how you're going to be able to withstand that. Well, we have the answer through the Word of God, and that's Jesus Christ. If you put your faith and trust in Him, acknowledge Him as your Lord and Savior. He will come into your heart and your life. He will, he will forgive you of your sins. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Comforter will reside in your, in your heart. The presence of God will be with you at all times. And you can then rely on Him instead of on your own strength. And Jesus never fails. We thank you, Father, uh, for watching over us. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your faithfulness, even when we are not always faithful. And we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.